So I'm Sarah Cox, I'm the Exhibitions Manager for the South West Heritage Trust and today I'm talking to Tom Mabry, the Chief Executive, um, who is also the curator of our current exhibition at the Museum of Somerset in Xanadu, Coleridge and Midwest Country, which runs until the end of June. Um, and I know, Tom, that your interest in Coleridge goes back a long way. Um, you wrote your wonderful book, Coleridge and Somerset, um, and Coleridge and Wordsworth in the West Country back in 1922, I believe. Um, so I'm just really interested to hear when you when you first encountered the poet um, and kind of what what drew you to the, the particular story of, of his time in Somerset. Um, I suppose that, I, like most people, I came to know something about Coleridge at school, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, we were probably all dragged through that at some stage in our, in our younger days. Um, I suppose it was my developing interest in the history of Somerset which spurred my interest in Coleridge, and I've still got the book by Bertha Lawrence called uh, uh, Coleridge and Wordsworth in Somerset, which it's inscribed from my mother and father, it says to Tom, on his 17th birthday. Um, and um, so that I read that book, I, I followed up some of the places that Bertha Lawrence so carefully describes, mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't able in my mind to put the story together in a way which seemed satisfactory to me. Um, I wanted to see how these lives were lived in these landscapes. Uh, I wanted uh, really to be able to place them in, in the scenes which I was trying to understand in a historical sense. Mm -hmm. And from that process arose uh, uh, a long period of research, which led in 1992 to the, to the book you've mentioned, Coleridge and Wordsworth in the West Country, which was really an attempt to place those three figures, those three friends in the landscape and to see how the, that quartet of things, a landscape, the Quantocks and West Somerset, and the friendship between Coleridge, Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth, uh, interacted in a, a sort of miraculous way during 1797 and 98 to give rise to something which has endured to the present day. Not only the particular poems they wrote, but the way of looking at the world, which took root so firmly in the volume they produced anonymously, uh, Lyrical Balance, and also, of course, in Dorothy Wordsworth's journal, which she began to write at Old Foxton. Yeah. So I suppose those were the, 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 the origins of it all. Um, I subsequently became a member of the Friends of Coleridge and got to know Reggie Waters, who was the who was who was a wonderful advocate for the poets and had studied him all his life as a as a teacher uh, and had retired to Nova Scotia. Uh, and he very much encouraged me in my further researches. And, and later, I became the chairman of the Friends and was involved with the National Trust in the two phases of restoration of Coleridge Cottage, which have uh, transformed it to the place that it, it, that it is today. So it's been a long, long history. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's really interesting to hear about. And, um, and obviously the story is something that people can uncover in the, by visiting the museum, visiting the exhibition. And um, so I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about um, the process of creating the exhibition, how it came together. Um, and are you pleased with the final, with the final result? I'm delighted with it. I, th I think that it, it looks so good, and that's got nothing to do with me. It's got a lot to do with you and a lot to do with the design team. Um, an exhibition which was going to be about a poem, about words essentially, uh, had, had a, a great danger of lapsing into impenetrability. After all, how do you sell words on a wall in an exhibition? Uh, and I think that that conundrum has been solved um, successfully in this exhibition. In terms of how we put it together, I think there's a, a long trajectory to that. I said, it, it's the case that uh, people who work for heritage organisations bring their own enthusiasms and in a way their own prejudices to a situation. So someone who is chiefly an archaeologist will give an archaeological slant to, to um, museum collections in, during his or her time. Um, I, I came to the Heritage Trust principally or originally as an archivist, and so I was always on the lookout for things that connected the Romantic poets to the West Country, yeah. and over time, over a period of more than 20 years, things have been gathered together which I think have found their moments in this exhibition, which is really wonderful to see. I look over there at the diaries of Parson Holland, 
who's now famous, almost as famous as Parson Book, but of, of, of the poor old Reverend Skinner uh, as, a, as one of the diarists of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, well, I, I, I was able to bring those into the, into the archive collections. Yeah. There's the, the clock by James Cole, um, Cole yeah. Coleridge's yeah. Never Stoic Friend. Yeah. And when that was offered for sale, we made every effort to, through donations and through other routes, to try and make sure we could we could secure it. It's a year going clock, it goes on and on. Uh, and then the portrait of Tom Poole, Coleridge's great Never Stoic Friend. Mm -hmm. um, that arose from, uh, from the kindness of the present Tom Poole, who, who still lives in Somerset, and uh, will, I hope, be visiting the, ex the exhibition shortly. But that was a wonderful gift to the museum collections. Uh, and, and the same could be said for quite a lot of the other objects around the place. And of course, the collections already contained, um, by accident, things which we didn't know were, were there. And yeah. it, was, it was wonderful. I don't think the proper word is rummage. I don't think uh, <laughs> heritage professionals don't rummage. They, they look in a, purpose, a purposeful and knowledgeable way. But I think we did to an extent rummage. And we discovered, for example, that there was a copy of the, I think it's 16, 15 edition of Purchase His Pilgrimage within the library collections we're responsible for. Uh, and that's the book, the very book, not the very copy, but certainly the very edition of the yeah. book that Coleridge for a sleepover in his opium vision at, at the farm near Colborne Church. So we, we were able to put that in the exhibition. And we knew that down the road uh, in the Unitarian Chapel was the Bible, the copy of the authorised version that he preached from in the pulpit at Mary Street Unitarian Chapel. So the, the uh, congregation there had very kindly lent us that for the exhibition. So all these objects, which in a way have been quietly harboring their stories, suddenly they've blossomed. And I think that's really wonderful to see in this exhibition, that sense of these objects suddenly finding their moment to speak. Yeah. And another one like that is over there, which is the, the banner of the uh, Never Stoey Female Friendly Society. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Female Friendly Society still exists, or at least its club walk still exists uh, every summer in Never Stoey when they process through the village lay uh, flowers on the grave of Tom Poole in the churchyard at Meadow Stowe. Um, but the banner they march behind is a replacement. It's a, because this one became so fragile that it could no longer be used in wind and weather. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was given to the museum service decades ago and we didn't know where it was. And I remember the moment when it was either you or your colleague Bethan rediscovered it and said, I think I've I think I've we found the Never Stoey Female Friendly Society banner, and, and there it was unrolled, and it was there. It was it was miraculous, and it's been conserved. And of course, on it are the words which Coleridge is supposed to have composed for Tom Poole: mm -hmm. foresight and union, uh, linked by Christian love. Um, it ends with and heaven above. I can't remember the middle <laughs> bit. Uh, and it's said, although. That Coleridge wrote the words is possible, but the further elaboration of the legend that Dorothy Wordsworth actually made it and embroidered it, right, I right. just don't think the dates were. Right, but that's a shame because that would have been a nice. It, it, it would have <laughs> been nice. I suppose she could have done it, but she would have had to done, have done it in the Lake District. Yeah, yeah. And sent it down in the carrier's car. <laughs> Seems more unlikely, but so, perhaps. <laughs> so uh, that, that was as a way of preamble to how we made the exhibition. Um, as I began by saying, it could easily have become an exhibition dominated by words, and we wanted it not to be that. Mm -hmm. And the museum's team, uh, you and your, your, your colleagues, made sure that this was a very powerfully visual exhibition with these wonderful uh, large-scale graphics, photographs of the landscapes and the places that Coleridge knew and that shaped him through life. So we marched from uh, the landscape of the, the River Otter uh, near Ottery St Mary where he was born and he went onto the banks of the River Otter with his father and you can still see his initials carved in the Pixies Parlour along the banks of the Otter mm -hmm. and then we moved to Bristol to Corner Street to the very heart of the teeming city that he discovered as a young man and where he began to, to, uh, to give his political lectures and to 
and to raise a reputation for himself as a, as a radical and made enemies too. Mm -hmm. And then his retreat through the landscapes which we see in smaller watercolours and images here to Nevistoli, to the scene in the cottage which is behind us. And onwards through the Pontoc Hills yeah. where he, he wandered uh, with his friends, with Tom Poole, with, with William Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth. Um, and then finally the exhibition closes with the, the scene in his, uh, well it's a picture of the outside of the house that he lived the last eight, uh, 18 years of his life in, in Highgate, as a sort of house guest but also semi-prisoner of the Highgate surgeon James Gilman, uh, who protected him from opium and alcohol. Though he, didn't, he wasn't being as successful as he thought because Coleridge would still slip away to the chemists at Highgate for supplies of laudanum. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and a picture also at the end of the garret room where he died in that house. Um, and so it, it, it takes you on a journey. Yeah. It, it tells a story and the documents which are interspersed around the exhibition uh, annotate that story. Yeah. Uh, and I think the way that our designers have used the documents is very clever because um, they're not just sat there dead in case they're actually punctuation marks in a story which is chiefly visual which will be yeah. the exhibition. And of course, you begin and end with the reason, the excuse for this exhibition, which is the very generous loan from the British Library to us of the authorial manuscript of Kubla Khan and the first edition with the Bristol imprint of lyrical ballads. It's, in, it's hard to exaggerate the significance of having the first edition of the Bristol imprint, uh, it, that is almost the holy grail of books because almost all copies of that book have the London imprint and there's, there are only a handful of copies which survive with the Bristol imprint. Three of them in the British Isles, the rest uh, in other places right. around the world, mostly in the United States. Yeah. Sorry, I... Uh, no, that's, yeah, no, so it really is a kind of unique opportunity to see these, these documents here in, in Somerset. Um, so I just wonder, it's clearly a very rich and um, exhibition, um, but I wonder if, if there's kind of one thing that you'd like visitors to take away, if that's a question that you can, can say something to. Um, I suppose it's an exhibition with several strands to it. Mm -hmm. There's a, a landscape journey, mm -hmm. and people, if they want, can simply enjoy the beauty of the, the landscape scenes through which Coleridge's life, life passed. In. Um, there's the story of Coleridge himself, mm -hmm. that, the thread of that, that journey from the small child on the banks of the River Otter, wandering the fields, stargazing with his father whom he so, he so loved and who, who died too soon from Coleridge's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and how that, how that story blossomed through his friendship with William Wordsworth, first in Bristol, then in Nether Stowey, and, and, and how almost like his own ancient mariner, mariner, his later years were spent in a, a kind of wandering, mm -hmm. uh, and he found refuge at last in Highgate. Um, never quite fulfilling the, the fullness of the promise which he had, he had so demonstrated when he was young. So there's a second strand. Yeah. But the third, uh, and perhaps the most powerful strand, is the one of, of friendship mm -hmm. and of landscape of that miraculous moment when those four things came together, the Quantocks, uh, William Wordsworth, Dorothy Wordsworth, Coleridge, and of course Tom Poole, uh, who was always there in the background. Mm -hmm. And that story of friendship, and that story of the excitement that you can feel still radiating from these documents of discovering a new way of thinking and doing things. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that perhaps is the most, the most powerful uh, thing that remains from this exhibition, the sort of glow that you carry with you, mm -hmm. that sense of the, the power of, of human relationship, of human, human emotion and human creativity, and how almost uh, unbelievably it did change the world, what happened in the Quantock Hills, because it changed the way that we looked at the world, we look at the world. Even today, we see the world through the lens of those young poets uh, and creators who, who gathered almost by accident in, in West Somerset over 200 years ago uh, and wandered the hills uh, and 
saw the world around them in a, in a new uh, and an enduring way. Well, thank you so much for talking to me this morning and we do hope lots of you come and see the exhibition um, which runs until the end of June.